So what do we got here? This is a very special book. It's called an incunable. It was printed in 1484. One of the oldest printed books. Just what we need, Rick, another old book. We sell old books. It's part of our job. It's part of our business. Part of his job is just to be a grumpy old bastard. Whatever. <laughs> <laughs> The book is uh, about a very famous theologian and philosopher, St. Thomas Aquinas. The book was bought at auction 20-something uh, years ago for $3,500, so I hope it's gone up since then and I can make a little bit of a profit. It's very interesting, the binding, actually. It's bound in pigskin, which okay. is uh, one of the early ways you would bind books. I mean, when you think about what this book survived, I mean, this was nine years before Columbus set sail for America. Okay, that is definitely cool. It's no secret that I love antique books. If it checks out, I'm definitely gonna want this for myself. I'm sort of in love with it already. <laughs> All of these little holes were made by bookworms. They munched away. Um, I don't think that's a good thing. Books this old tend to be really rare and valuable but it's in rough shape, and I don't want to take a gamble before I have Rebecca check it out. Some of the most beautiful books ever printed are some of the earliest. And this is actually quite a beautiful book. With most books, age doesn't matter, right? When you have edition, first edition, that's what you want, the first book printed. The exception, incunables. They are actually collected simply because of their age. Rick, you brought me in. What are you worried about? I don't know if this is great condition or this is really bad condition, because it is 1484. Really have to consider the condition for different time periods. When you're talking about a 15th century book, there's actually a little bit more leeway. So for example, the wormholing that you're seeing, a lot of 15th century books have wormholing. It doesn't hurt the value very much. Now, we do have a problem. Okay, what's the problem? A very important aspect of this book is not original. Really? This black coloring here, black is a most unusual color for a 15th century illumination. This illumination is at best late 19th century. So what do you think it's worth right now? If this were a 15th century illumination, you'd be looking at a, a price range of, you know, six to seven thousand dollars. Right now, it's worth thirty five hundred to four thousand. Really? That's yeah. Great. Thanks a lot. You're welcome. Thanks, Rebecca. Yep, good seeing you. Even though the illumination was put in the book later, it's one of the first books ever printed, and I would love to have it. Is three thousand dollars fair? I'll tell you what, I, I will do 2500 I won't do a penny more. I mean, how many times do you get an incunable in your shop here? Uh, not very often, but remember, there's a supply and demand thing. I mean... Meet me at three. I'll do 2500 uh, I'll, I'll do twenty-five. Twenty-five hundred. 2500 You got it. Meet you right over there. I got this old card-playing book, published in 1866, I think you'd be interested in. Sweet. Does it teach you about having a poker face? That's pretty good. This book, not in the best condition, but it's an old book. I think it was just for the home use, people wanting to learn the different card games. I'm hoping to get 1,500, and the least amount would be 1,000. So where'd you get the book from? One in a poker game. So let me get this right. You're playing a poker game with your buddy, mm -hmm. and you make a raise, and he can't cover with chips, so you say, how about that old poker book? Yeah. That's how it went. <laughs> I like your style. You said it was published when? In 1866. The long whist, dumby or three-handed whist, five-card cribbage. It's got a lot of games I've never heard of, man. Straight poker, draw poker. Never heard of whiskey poker, but I have heard of stud poker. All right, so it does have some poker in there. This is a really cool book. I think a book like this belongs here in Vegas. A town like this was built on card playing. Yes, it was. That's why I brought it here. Rick always tells me to buy things from the early days of gambling. And this book is practically ancient. It might be falling apart a little, but I might go drop a $20 bill and pick this thing up for myself. How much do you want to sell it for? 1500 1500 man, I was thinking 20, 30 bucks. 
I looked online, I found one similar, and they were asking 25. You sure there wasn't a decimal point after that five? No, there was, and I looked over it again and again. Um, not saying I don't believe you, man, but that's a lot of money for a book on card rules. But it is pretty old. I got my book expert in the back, and she's going over a few other things. So I'd like her to come take a look at this, if you don't have any objection to that. I welcome it. I'd, I'd like to know more about the book. All right, cool. I'm very happy that the book expert's here. I'm ready to prove them wrong and walk out with some money. Well, Rebecca, sorry to pull you away from the dungeon with Rick, but here's the rule book I was telling you about. I'm in the back. I'm looking at a bunch of books for Rick, and then Chum calls me out. He wants me to look at another book. These guys are all business. Can't we just go out and get a cup of coffee? So much to ask. <laughs> what do we have here? Book published in 1866 about different card games. OK. Where'd you get it? Won it in a poker game. You won a card book in a poker game? Yes, I did. All right. Well, let's take a look at it then. So this is just a great example of one of those how-to books that they had in the 19th century. These things were really popular because there wasn't a great educational system. So then you get all these how-to books, how to be a gentleman, how to cook, how to clean, how to play cards. Is a book like this actually collectible? You know, it's not a first edition Huckleberry Finn, but there are people who really love collecting gambling books. So there is a market for it. The thing that's interesting about this book in particular is that there weren't actually any books on the rules of poker until 1858 that's documented. So this one at 1866 is kind of a big deal. And there are some other things going on with it that might be interesting to a collector. Las Vegas is the perfect market for this because you're going to have people who are really excited about gambling and you have professional poker players coming here all the time. They'd love something like this. So he wants 1500 bucks for this beat up old dusty book. Well, a book like this you expect to be beat up. It's going to be heavily used. I mean, that being said, what I would place this book at if I were to give it a price, I would say 2000 maybe a little bit more. $2,000? Are you guys taking shots in the back row? <laughs> All right. Wow, sounds like you got a winner here. Oh, yeah. All right, well, thank you. Yep, my pleasure. Chum was really surprised about how much this book could go for, but there's a whole genre of collecting gambling books, so there is a market for it. So how much do you want to get for it? She said 2000 How about 1800 I'm not going to go that high. My boss would kill me if I bought a book for $1,800 and made $200 on it, and if it sat in here for a year, there's no way I'd keep my job. I'm looking more like about $1,200. That's too low. It'd be an easy sell. It's not as easy as you think. I think it is. You're in Vegas. If this was first Tom Sawyer, I could put this in this case, and it would be gone tomorrow. But it's a specialized book on gambling, so give me a more realistic number that I could work with, man. 1600 If you can come down just a little bit more, maybe 1350 you know, I, I could definitely make a deal with you. Make it 14 you can go write it up. I think I'm going to have to leave it on the table with you. 1375 and you can go write it up. I'm not going to beat you up over $25. That's a deal. Lucky for me, I got a good deal on the poker book. Now I just got to make sure Skiba doesn't eat it for lunch. Hi. Hey, how can I help you? What do we got here? So I have here what is considered the first written history of baseball. The first written history of baseball. This is cool. I love how serious they look. God, and I love the mustaches. Super cool. And what year is this? Uh, I believe it's 1910. I did some research on the book, and I believe this is the, the first book that incorporated like biographies of just every major league and former major league player of that era. I love the photographs in this thing. Honus Wagner, that's pretty cool. Tyrus Cobb, who in my opinion was the greatest baseball player in the world ever. The prints in these books, I mean, I imagine would be worth money. None of the pages are missing, are they? No, the book is complete. How much do you want for it? 
I was looking to get 1300 out of it. 1300 bucks. Yeah. All right, so I would like to have a few people maybe take a look at it. Okay. Um, quite honestly, I've never seen this book before. I've never heard of this book. It doesn't mean it's not worth money. It just means I haven't heard of it. So do you mind if I give someone a call, take a look at this? Yeah, sure, absolutely. It's a cool book. It came out in the early 1900s. It's packed with photos. Do you mind if I open it up? Yeah, sure, go ahead. So you've heard of the book? Yeah, I've definitely heard of the book. In the sports collectibles world, this is definitely considered the baseball Bible. Yeah, it's signed by the, by the author, I and mean, he's got a PSA on it, so we know, it's, we know that's good. Yeah. Alfred Henry Spink established the Sporting News. It was considered the first baseball newspaper that came out you know, into the public. OK. What do you think it's worth? I think in a retail market, you're looking at $1,200. OK. I, I just want one more person to look at it. Because this is sort of weird. It sort of crosses two lines. We have like the sports world and we have like the book world. And just bear with me. I just want okay. one more person to look at it. Um, I'll be right back. All right. Hi, Rick. How are you? She's the book nerd. Oh, okay. <laughs> I prefer book expert. <laughs> okay, yeah, all right. All so right, we got? this is the national game. It's a history of baseball from a hundred and some years ago. <laughs> <laughs> this book is definitely on its own, signed or not, very collectible. This is something that people who are interested in the history of baseball, they want. You know, over time, these, these people become legends, right? This is when that first really starts happening. It's a myth-making book, right? right? We are finally being able to look back upon all of these formative years. Instead of being like in the rough and tumble of it, you're saying, oh, remember when this happened and that happened? Yeah. And you start shaping the myth of what baseball was, and it becomes bigger and grander. But uh, I do want to look at condition, though. With a book like this, condition is really important. It looks well-read. <laughs> it's not bad. How a book kind of presents is really important. So this actually has a really bright gilt and that matters. When you turn it a little bit, it's less so. It's a little bit more dull here. So it's got strong eye appeal. Yeah, in the book world, we'll say it shows well. OK. And it's, it's signed by the author. He's got the mm -hmm. paperwork here. I, um, unlike a lot of memorabilia dealers, much, much prefer having inscriptions rather than signatures because it gives you more data to work with. So I greatly prefer inscriptions. So yeah, in terms of condition, it's, I mean, it has a couple of flaws, but for this book, it is quite nice. Okay. So I had Dan come by and look at it. Ah. He says, you know, he told me he thinks it's worth like 1200 bucks. Hmm. But um, in my head, I'm sort of thinking that it's more of a bookstore thing than a sports store thing, and that's why I called you up. Right, so you're right that there are different markets. So in my experience, there are book people who also love sports and will buy books about the history of sports. Okay, so what do you think it's worth? Talking about what I know copies of this have traded at, this is a pretty nice copy and condition is king with it when it comes to books. And the other thing is that it is scarce to have it signed. And so what I would expect for a copy in this condition to go for in the book market, I wouldn't feel bad pricing it at 2500 Great. OK, you're absolutely amazing. Glad I could help. Told you she was a book nerd. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah. Thanks. So when you walked in here, how much money did you want? I wanted 1300 But I mean, I never, I never had a book expert look at the book. And I mean, I always thought that it was in really good condition. So this I'll looks... give you 1300 bucks. Can you do 16? No, no. I mean, it will take a while to sell. I know she said $2,500 and I'm offering you $1,300, but you have to understand the market. It is a book, it is not gonna sell immediately. I give you 1,300 bucks, I think we're both happy that way. All right, 1,300, I gotta okay, do it. Sweet, um, I'll meet you right around the corner and we'll do some paperwork. All right, thank you. I got a really good price at 1,300. I'm going to take that $1,300 and invest it into a Babe Ruth baseball. I have a 1652 copy of Elias Ashmole's Theatrum Chemicum Britannicum. In it is the secret to creating the Philosopher's Stone. What is that? The Philosopher's Stone was basically the secret manuscript to create gold. So the secret's in this book? The secrets are in this book. I have a 1652 copy of Elias Ashmole's Theatrum Chemicum Britannicum. I bought the book several years ago from an antiquarian book dealer. They say you can't turn lead into gold, but I'm hoping to take this book and turn it into cash. I believe this is a book on alchemy. What is alchemy? 
Alchemy is the art of transmutating metals. They figured if they combine the right ingredients, mercury and some sulfur and a little lead, if you come up with a secret to that, you can live forever and make gold. Or you died. <laughs> so there's a formula that will help me turn things into gold inside this book. There's actually quite a few formulas. Sweet. I know a little bit about this book. I know this was a combination of a bunch of older texts that were translated into English. Technically, this book was illegal. The practicing of alchemy when it was printed was a capital crime because all the countries of Europe believed if you were actually able to come up with a formula for making gold, all the gold in their treasuries would be worthless. So there's also books on alchemy that the Catholic Church actually wrote down on a list. This is a heretical book. And it's, I think the exact punishment for being caught doing alchemy at the time was to be hung from gilded gallows. There were scientists genuinely trying to create gold and thought they might have created something. And then there was a lot of charlatans who were going around selling, you know, I got the secret manuscript, you know. It's a very interesting history. This diagram here contained the key to all the secrets that are in this book. Have you ever heard of The Ninth Gate? Yes. The movie with Johnny Depp? The folding diagram there is called the Twelfth Gate. The Ninth Gate is a fictional reinterpretation of the Twelfth Gate, which that is an actual illustration from. There's a lot of interesting things that are going on in that book. I think it's really, really cool. Uh -huh. How much do you want for it? I want $23,000. I... I need someone to look at it. I just don't know nearly enough about this book. That's great. Give me five minutes. No problem. Here it is. The Philosopher's Stone. Yes, all right. I know this book. This has sort of a fraught history. Up until about 1500, alchemical works, even though the printing press had been around for 50 years, were not printed because the idea was there was only a small circle that kind of kept this among themselves, and they didn't want the public to know. And it was very important influence on later scientists. Notably, Isaac Newton used this a lot. It was his most consulted alchemical text. OK. What kind of condition do you think it's in? Let's see. OK, because one of the things about this book is that it's really hard to find complete. It has the folding plate, which most copies don't have. That said, the thing that appears to be missing in here is a full page engraved plate that's supposed to go here. In addition to that, looking at the condition here, this is a lot of repairs. And it's like full page. Like, it's really hard to tell here, too, like, if this entire piece here was missing. So what do you think it's worth? It's not a book that comes up that often. I've known a complete copy that's beautiful without all these repairs that's sold for over 30000 But copies that are incomplete without that folding plate, 10000 or less. So this one, with all the repairs and missing a plate, I would place more around 15000 you're great. I think you turned this old dusty book into gold. <laughs> I tried. <laughs> All right, thanks, Jim. You're the Good best. Good seeing you. Even though this is not the ideal copy, this book is legitimately scarce. I don't think Rick would go wrong in buying this at a reasonable price. I absolutely love this. I'll give you $9,000 for it. I don't think I can do nine. Uh, how about 12? No. I'll tell you what, I'll give you 10 grand for it. That's about as much as I can go. It's. I think it's more than a fair price. How about $10,500? You know what I'm feeling very generous today? I'll give you $10,003. i will take it. Sweet. Great. You want to go write them up? Sure, let me get this book right no, here. No, 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 don't touch this. Just write them up, please. Go on. Maybe you can just tell me some of those secrets so I don't have to read I that sure whole will. book. I think I can actually make gold with this. What have we got this time? OK, this time I have brought for you the most incomplete book that I've ever brought. This is an actual printed page from the Gutenberg Bible, the very first printed book. Well, there was printing before Gutenberg's printing press, but those all sucked. <laughs> this time, I think I brought Rick something really unbelievable. It's a single leaf from the Gutenberg Bible. It's really the first substantial printed book uh, in the history of the world. 
So we have a leaf here, which is a page. This is one page from the Gutenberg Bible. You may ask why there is only one page. In the 1920s, a famous book dealer named Gabriel Wells came upon an incomplete copy of the Gutenberg Bible and he broke it up into single pages, and he put it with a bibliographical essay, and he had it very beautifully browned, and he sold them as single pages where he puts a leaf of the Gutenberg Bible, and in the approximate years that they believe it was printed. Is it printed on the other side? Yeah, it's a double-sided leaf. It's printed on very fine paper that they imported from Italy into Germany in the period and it's been hand rubricated with colors with red and blue after it's been printed so that it looked more like a manuscript. That's pretty amazing. The Gutenberg Bible to this day is regarded as one of the most beautifully printed books. He had to invent the type. He had to invent the press that it went into. He had to invent the ink. It was a massive undertaking. It's like the internet to think how quickly they went from printing a book like this to having people copy the invention, to go throughout Europe setting up printing centers all through Europe within 50 years. It literally was like the internet. It went from this to scientific books, to fiction, to dirty pictures, to uh, a little bit of everything. And Well, there's no more important invention in the history of democracy than the printing press, because it's the democratization of knowledge. It puts the power of knowledge into the hands of the people. And you found this in one of your travels? Well, this came from an estate. It originally belonged to a printer, and I bought it from the estate. I mean, I was beyond thrilled to find it. This particular leaf is from the Old Testament. It's from the second book of Chronicles, which is towards the end of the Hebrew Bible. And it talks about the purification of the temple in Jerusalem. Cool. OK, so the big question, how much you want for it? I came up with a number, and you better brace yourself, but remember the importance of the book, of $65,000 for the page. OK. Like always, I'm going to call Rebecca. Um, let me get her down here. Oh, this I, is. Uh, I would be delighted. She's going to be. I, I mean, think she'll be flawed to see it. $65,000. Adam is a regular customer of mine that sells me things on a regular basis. He brought in a leaf from the Gutenberg Bible, and it's absolutely amazing. But he wants $65,000. And it would be a sin if I didn't make a profit on this thing. So I'm calling in Rebecca. Hello. The world's most famous book person meets the world's most famous book. <laughs> is that what I think it is? It's a page of it. <laughs> right, a leaf. A page to me, a leaf to you. Well, a page is actually one oh. side and then the other, so it's two pages, one leaf. All right, you got me, OK. Well, the most important thing is it's a leaf from the Gutenberg Bible. Yeah, and I just touched it. The no, Gutenberg Bible, <laughs> I just okay. touched it. So when was the last complete Gutenberg Bible sold? The, the right. full set hasn't been sold since the 70s. Yeah, it's been decades upon decades. Okay, and in yeah. the meantime, other books have gone for over $10 million. I mean, this would just be astronomical. It would break all the records. So the thing is, is it real? Can I hold it up to the light? Sure, sure. OK. I've seen Gutenberg Bibles before, but I don't think that I've had a chance at this length to really inspect one. Like, this is a chance that most people are never going to get, even rare book specialists. I would touch it, but I'm afraid I'd catch on fire. <laughs> I'm holding it up to the light so that I can see the chain lines that you see in handmade paper that comes specifically from paper of this period. It's real, correct? Yes. OK. What's it worth? Dealers I know and trust, they're going to place this around $80,000. Uh, so I think that is fair to ask for the way things are looking right now in the market. You're the best. Yep. Happy to help. Well, thanks so much, Rebecca. Really yep. appreciate it. Mm -hmm. So you heard from your friend and eminent book expert. So how much would you be willing to go? Of all the business we've done over the years, and like... You I mean, give me a number what you're comfortable with. 40,000. I can't do 40 on it. I mean, I mean that, that's what I feel comfortable with. Auctions yeah. are definitely not an exact science. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, 40,000 is just so on the low scale in terms of what I can, I can take for it. I mean, I didn't even want to come down so low, but 55. Right. You know, I'm, I'm trying to be fair with you, Rick. I, I, and I know you are. I would go 45,000. That's the best I could do. 
I'm going to offer it to you for 47000 and it would be foolish for you to say no. And that is a price I did not imagine I would even agree to. I have a CFO in an office right down the hallway that's going to be really mad at me. So 47, we got to do. You're not going to be mad when you make <laughs> make a small fortune. On um, it. it's amazing. Uh, I'll meet you right up front. Let me get someone to keep an eye on this, and I'll do some paperwork. Why do you need someone to keep an eye? It's only a page. No, it's two pages. It's one leaf. Oh, uh, you're right. <laughs> <sighs> that's right. I now own a page of the Gutenberg Bible. What do we got here? This is my copy of Sanson's Pocket Atlas from 1700. So you, someone's got some really, really big pockets? <laughs> I bought this atlas uh, on an online auction. I paid about 7,500 for this atlas, and it's really not something I can display. I was always afraid of putting it out on the coffee table and having one of my friends put a drink on top of it, so it just kind of sits on the shelf collecting dust. Uh, this is absolutely great. So you said there's a date on this from 1700? Yes, that's the date it was printed. Do you know why atlases are called atlases? No. Way back in the day, one of the guys who wrote one of the first great books of maps and everything, mm -hmm. he put the god Atlas on the front of it, mm. on the cover, holding up, you know, the universe. And it stuck. <laughs> and it stuck. So that's where the word whole atlas thing came from. Sure. So does it have the island of California in it? It does have the island of California. It's actually one of the first maps that are in there. Uh, okay. It's actually broken out by continent. Um, so it is written in French. One of the reasons I'm looking to sell it. Didn't know it was in French before I bought it. Just about everything would be written in French or Latin. Mm -hmm. Because if you were educated, you do those languages. The cool thing here is it tells you about a particular place and then shows a map of it. Mm -hmm. And it was much more expensive when you bought maps that were colorized. Mm -hmm. And um, They've actually done a lot of the capitals with little gold dots. Uh, I noticed that in some, a lot of the European ones. Yeah. Now, was this thing in a flood or something? I'm assuming it traveled around the world, so uh, it probably got a little weathered uh, during uh, the I process. didn't get weathered, it got wet. Yeah. OK, th there's, a, there, there's a difference, um, especially when you're dealing with maps. Um, didn't seem to have affected any of the pictures. OK. They're all well, still... well, it's affected these. These are, you know, th this has water damage. It definitely affects the value. Um, and you can see some of the bleed through from the ink. Um, see how this yellow has gone over here? Mm -hmm. It affects the value of the book. Uh, sure. Matter of fact, it still feels moist a little bit. Um, see this mold? Mm -hmm. It will spread. Yeah. It has to be abated, so. I don't know how it's sitting on a, sitting on a shelf in the box. Um, how much do you want for it? I'm asking for $20,000. OK. Um, Actually, it sounds a little high, I, I'll be honest with you. I mean, um, let me have someone take a look at this. I have a friend who is like the smartest book person in the world, sort of. Cool. I mean, she's written books about books. That's interesting. Yeah. <laughs> I might read one of her books about books. All right, so I'm going to give her a call, get cool. her down here, and um, she'll help us figure it out. Awesome. All right. So I'm really excited to have the expert look at my book today. And if I do sell it, I'd love to hear more about it before I part with it. A guy brought in a atlas published in 1700. There's a lot of damage to this book. So I've called in Rebecca to see if it's even worth dealing with, considering the state it's in. The woman who writes books about books. And here's a book about maps. <laughs> OK. Is this a book for a traveler? Or? The person who's buying this book, they're not expecting him to travel around the world and see all these places. Mm -hmm. In some ways, it's meant for entertainment, but in other ways, it's meant for status. You have the atlas that is the terrestrial or the like Earth sphere, right. and then you have the mapping of the, the heavens, the skies, the celestial sphere. So it's a book within a book? It's like a bonus book. I am noticing as I go through this definite signs of mold. Actually, if it were just on the pages, I wouldn't have that much of a problem. But I'm really concerned about how much the color, the thing that is the real big selling point for this, is affected by the damp staining. Sure. So I mean, after you take all the facts in here and like put it in, into the book calculator, See where you end up. What number do you come up with? Well, the big question mark of how thorough is the mold damage, um, and how much can be saved? Because when you're talking about hand coloring that adds an additional element of complexity to cleaning up damage. Maybe 12,000. So to get this rebound 
and do all the remediation, a minimum of 2,000 maybe? 2,000 does not strike me as absurd. Okay, you're the best. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. I think that this book has a lot of problems and probably more problems than it's worth. It's a beautiful book, but it's gamble. So what do you want for it now? Well, based on what she just said, $8,000. I'd give you $5,500 for it. I'm gonna, I'm, I, I, at a minimum, I'm gonna be spending $2,000, right. okay? I'm at eight. I'm at 5,500. 5, you know, normally I would negotiate with you, but this is like straight up gambling, okay? okay? I'm literally taking my money and throwing it on a blackjack table. It's tied up money for a long time, all those other things, and... Uh, Why don't you do six? I I'll feel go 5,500 bucks, because like, normally, there's always variables and risk in business. There's more here, okay? And anything more than 5,500, I'm just not comfortable because I'm sort of buying a pig and a poke. Um, I'll sell it to you for 5,500. I think we got a deal. <laughs> Thanks, man. Thank I'll you. meet you right over there and uh, we'll just paperwork. Cool. At this point, I think it's time that I just cut my losses and sell it and hopefully they can give it a better home than I did. I got a couple of old historic books I thought you might want to look at. Okay. The 1802 edition of the Federalist Papers. Volumes one and two? Yes, it came in two volumes. It's the second edition. The guy that's name is in there was the fourth Postmaster General of the United States. I was hoping that was gonna say like George Washington or something in it. <laughs> I wanna sell my 1802 Federalist Papers. I think someone that's a history buff would be interested in buying the Federalist Papers to add to their collection. I'm asking $8,250, and we'll put the money towards building a new barn at home if we make a deal today. I, I'm really excited about them. They're really neat. Where did you get these? My husband dug them out of the trash and brought them home. He dug them out of someone's trash? Yes. Wow. I, I'm just sort of like a shock. You don't normally see things like this. Um, these were all letters arguing for the Constitution we have now. And a lot of people were completely against it. They wanted us to stay as 13 independent countries with a much weaker central government. And Hamilton, Madison, and Jay were publishing these anonymous letters for the Constitution. And they were explaining all the different parts of the Constitution to convince people to go along with the Constitution. And there's some pretty interesting writing in here. Yes, there is. So you want to sell them? Yes, I do. Okay. And how much do you want for them? Well, I've seen them advertised for fourteen to 16000 so I thought 8250 would be fair. Okay. So I mean, were these prices on the internet or something like that? Yes, it was an internet bookstore. All right. These things might be in great condition or terrible condition. I have no idea. Um, do you mind if I have someone look at them? No, that'd be fine. Okay, I have a friend who knows everything there is to know about this stuff, and she's probably going to completely nerd out on these. Okay, so... Okay. Uh, Sounds okay. good. All right, I'll be right back. Okay. I'm looking forward to hearing their opinion on the books, the condition, the value, and the importance towards our history. A lady brought in an early copy of the Federalist Papers and wants upwards of $8,000. Now, they're in pretty rough shape, and judging the condition of a book is sort of like an art form. How's it going? Not bad. How are you? Good. That's why I called her Rebecca, because she knows how to do it. What do we have? These are the Federalist Papers. She says they're the second edition. I don't know if these are really bad condition or just bad condition. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's see. 1802 edition, the last edition before Hamilton's death and Hamilton's early death by duel was, in fact, really kind of a shame for American history because he doesn't often get his due. Hamilton's a really important guy. He essentially established the economic foundations for the federal government. He wrote many of the essays here, and this is one of the great works in American history. I mean, it's huge, and it's something that every collector wants. Um, but. We gotta stop for a second. <sighs> um, I am seriously concerned that this might be mold. Okay. And if it's mold, you'd need a very serious cleaning of the paper and the boards. Where did you get this? From the trash. Okay, yeah, it's probably mold. <laughs> okay. But it's worth salvaging. Okay. And the repairs you're looking at, probably at least $1,000. Okay, so then how much would they be worth 
if they were all restored. Um, if it works out nicely, it could be up to 14,000, I would say. Okay, now she just nice made stuff. everything more complicated. That's what I do. <laughs> Thanks. Okay. Rick's trying not to show it in front of the seller, but I think he's really excited by this book. Everyone wants it, it's so important. It's some of our most intellectually stimulating, and fascinating people in the history of America. And frankly, it's a good business decision to get. Okay, um, what would be your best price? I still think they're worth what I'm asking, 8250 I mean, this is my situation. I buy them off you. And somewhere north of $1,000, I'm going to pay to get them restored. Uh, then I have to wait six months, and then I get them back, and then I have to sell them. How about 7500 I mean, this is literally, I give you the money. I'm not even going to see any type of return for over a year, most likely. I mean, 65? 7,250. <laughs> That's bringing me down from my beginning. How about $7,000? I think it's a good price. At 7,000? Okay, I'll take it. Thanks, um, cool. Come this way and uh, we'll do some paperwork. Just leave them right there. Our daughter was always teasing my husband about digging through the trash, but it just made us $7,000 richer. Brought you another very exciting book. OK. The Wizard of Oz, first Whoa. edition. You mean The Wonderful Wizard of Oz? Well, that depends on what price you pay for it. So. <laughs> <laughs> I bought the book from a family that had it for over 100 years. This book is also one of the first copies ever printed before it became a phenomenal success. I travel pretty far and wide looking for interesting libraries and rare books, and uh, occasionally I find some. This is actually not only a first edition of the book, but this is actually a signed first edition. That is definitely cool. You can see on the first title page they have the famous Tin Man, the Scarecrow, which are not so far off from the film adaptations of them. I love that they're color yeah. illustrations, though. But my problem is it's a little rough shape, I'll tell you that. All right, um, so how much you want for it? I was thinking, though, something on the order of uh, $10,000. All right. It is really rough shape. It even looks like it has some water damage on it. There are obviously some condition issues, like you said, but I do think this is one of the earliest copies of the book. And also, it is signed by the author, and I think that really adds to its rarity. Let, let me get Rebecca down here so we can figure out what this thing is worth. Were all copies like color pages and everything like that? Yes. Uh, this book, the illustrations were very, very important. It was very, very visual. Baum had a background in stage and musicals, and he very much visualized this as something meant for the stage. Uh, am I going to be able to sell it in that bad a shape? I should tell you, by the way, I had it restored. Yeah, I can see. Mm -hmm. If that's restored, I'd hate to see how it was when you first got it. You can see this was put together with tape that was not archival. It was very, very acidic, and it's left all of these marks here. So in this kind of shape, what do you think it would sell for? There will be people who want it. However, given the shape that it's in, people are going to lowball you. The only way you're going to realize something is if it gets cleaned up more with restoration. And that can get really expensive, too. I mean, oh, I know that. Like thousands. Should the restoration go well, I could see that this copy restored fetching up to 30000 <sighs> OK. Um, I just don't know what to say. It's a project for you if you want to uh, I mean, I, I've, take it. I've had three and four year projects with books. Yeah. And um, sometimes they work out, sometimes they don't. You know, I, I don't mean to beat you up, but I'd risk three grand on it. I wouldn't risk no more. And I know it doesn't sound like a lot yeah. of money, but it's it's going to turn into a two-year project for me. That's the problem. I understand. I honestly have more than that in it. I mean, and the restoration was very expensive, what I did so far. I mean, the absolute bottom dollar number is going to be something like $6,000. I don't think we're going to make a deal, then, because the best I'm going to go is four. 
yeah, I, I, I can't do four. Sorry on this one, but you know, I'm gonna have to click my heels three times and take it home, I think. <laughs> okay. So, uh, All right, if you change your mind. No Thanks, problem. man. Thanks nice to see you. So what do we have here? I got something kind of cool. Rip Van Winkle. It could be a first edition. Okay. Do you know what the story's about? Rip Van Winkle gets trashed and wakes up years later. But when he wakes up, his wife is dead, his kids are grown, everything has changed. I've given him my best shot, but I couldn't sleep for as long as he did. <laughs> we I've there. lost a day or two once or twice. <laughs> <laughs> I have this really cool, over 100-year-old book. It's Rip Van Winkle, and the pictures in the thing are fantastic. I'm hoping to get 1,500 today. This is definitely an interesting book. It was written by Washington Irving. Oh, uh, yeah. It was like the first really great American author. Right. You know, I mean, he, he did Sleepy Hollow. Yeah. And it's a really short story, too. I mean, if you look at this, it looks like a full-size book, but, but it only goes for 60 pages. Actually, there's great illustrations in here. That's cool. The prints are really pretty. They're great. Um, I've never really seen drawings like this from this early. Do you know who the artist is? A guy named Rackham. I think it's on the front. I can almost guarantee you he was a really famous artist. This was really popular at around 1900, 1910 to make really expensive books. In the early 1900s, books like this with fine art were considered very high-end collectibles. And depending on condition and some other factors, can be worth a lot of money. It's really, really interesting. I'm, I'm intrigued. What were you looking to do with it? I'm looking to get 1500 for the book. OK. Um, the problem is <sighs> condition, which um, this is not pretty. No, it's a little scuff. And um, if you look right here, 1909. It's not a first edition Rip Van Winkle, because Rip Van Winkle was published long right. before this. But it could be a first edition with the illustrations. Yeah, and that's what makes the money in these kind of books. But I have a friend. She's probably like one of the top 20 book experts in the world. Let her take a look at it. She'll know everything about it. That would be great. You have a book for me. Yes, I do. Rip Van Winkle. OK. OK, well, I know it's not a first edition, because Rip right. Van Winkle was written like when the 1820s, somewhere around there. Yeah, early 19th century of Van Winkle, of course, by Washington Irving, one of the great early American authors. What you've got here, though, it's illustrated by Arthur Rackham. In the early 20th century, there's this era called the Golden Age of Illustration, and Rackham is sort of the king of the Golden Age of Illustration. Absolutely gorgeous. All right, Rick, what are you worried about here? Um, I have no idea what it's worth. All right. The first thing we need to see is whether or not it's a first edition illustrated by Arthur Rackham. Oftentimes, that can get up into thousands easily, like 9,000 even. Okay. So what do we got here? All right. Um, and I can tell you just by looking at the title page, this is not a first edition of the Rackham. The first illustrated edition came out in 1905. It says 1909 on the title page. Job done. OK, so five bucks. <laughs> <laughs> well, given the condition, which obviously makes a huge difference, um, I would probably place it more around like 300. OK. Not a complete loss. No, not bad at all. The thing that really saves it is you've got these really beautiful plates. Did they ever cut these apart and frame those, or...? I'm going to pretend you didn't ask that question. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, you're the you're best. You're welcome, Rick. I'm happy to help out Rick. This is a fine book. And I know it's not a first at Rackham edition, but it's still got some really beautiful plates, and they're all intact. But I think it's something good for the pawn shop. I told you she knows everything there is to know about books. You ought to pay me $50 everything she just taught you. <laughs> and that's what I'll give you, 50 bucks for the thing. I know she said it was worth $300, but I just don't see it flying off the shelf. Um, but given that, I would counter with 175 No. This is going to sit for infinity. Collectors look at it, oh, it's pretty beat up. 
And Beautiful it's, pictures. And it's not a first edition. And 150 sounds like a perfect price to settle on then. I give you $75. Not even a hundred. Nope, 75 bucks. That's cash right now. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'll take that. All right, I'll meet you right up front. $75. Today's economy, yeah, you gotta be happy with $75. Hey, how's it going? Hi. So what do we have here? I brought you some beautiful historical books. These are the 1814, 1815, um, publication of the Naval History of the United States that are signed by President John Adams. Oh, sweet. So this is the History of the United States Navy. That's cool. Yes. We had the most high-tech ships in the world. The USS Constitution had the nickname Old Ironsides. That's because in the War of 1812, mm -hmm. a British frigate fired on it, the cannonballs bounced off the side of it. That's awesome. And, and it got the nickname <laughs> Old Ironsides. So uh, we have... Inside of each book is a book plate from the personal library of President John Adams. Whoa, that's fancy. The publisher signed these books and gave them as a gift to President John Adams, right here. Okay. There's one other additional fact, too. Right here, the books have been given to Lieutenant Charles Thomas Clark, and they are signed from President Adams. That is cool. How much were you asking for? 200,000. I've sold books that belong to early presidents for a lot of money before. So let me call up a friend of mine. If there's anybody on the planet who will know everything about these, it will be her. OK, so, sounds um, great. I look forward to talking to an expert to see what they think about these amazing books. This is the uber book nerd I was telling you about. Wonderful. <laughs> and you have something for me to nerd out? Um, yes, we have two books from uh, President Adams Library. She wants a lot of money for them, and I, I don't know, it, it, they're books. They're, there's a million and one questions. Oh. Presented as a mark of respect to His Excellency John Adams Esquire by the publisher. That's nice. I mean, it's part of the history of how this book came to be in the first place. This is Clark's naval history. There's a close connection that John Adams has to this book. So Thomas Clark was an acquaintance of his, and he encouraged Clark to write this naval history in the first place. Oh, that's so cool. This is post um, War of 1812. This is the second edition. And the first edition was only in one volume. And the second edition was greatly revised and expanded. And you know where those revisions and expansions came from? Oh. John Adams talking to both Clark and the publisher, Carey, about what he felt should be included. So as far as the type of volumes you could have that were once in John Adams' library, this is pretty interesting. OK. People love presidents. And the founding fathers, in particular, formed a nation based on intellectual ideas that they were reading. So if you have a book that one of these founding fathers was reading, it's kind of a big deal. But this is kind of a problem, because when the provenance is here, and then it is modernly attached here, there could be questions about whether this originally went with that. Lucky you, this has evidence of offsetting, which is only going to happen over a very long period of time. These were together. And this is the right book plate for John Adams. And there are no red flags for me as far as tampering that it could have been added on modernly. OK. But there is one problem, the thing that gets people really excited is when you have writing in the person's hand. This is not John Adams' hand. And this is 1817. Uh, Adams suffered from palsy. He very often wouldn't write things himself. You can still find letters from this time, but uh, he had secretaries do a lot of his writing. That means you're losing one of the major reasons that people collect such a volume. So. For that reason, I would evaluate this more around the range of 10 to 12,000. OK. Wow. Thanks. You're the best. Glad to help. Thanks. Thank you. Take care. Where I work, we sell autograph letters by John Adams. I'm very familiar with his autograph. I'm very familiar with his handwriting. It's something that I can recognize immediately. And that's what I did not see when I opened the book today. So 
Do you have another figure besides 200,000? <laughs> the lowest I would go is about 50,000. <sighs> yeah, the most I'm going to go is 10. There so, you have it. Thanks for bringing him in. Hey, oh, okay. cool. Appreciate it. Was it. nice to learn about him. Thanks for your time. Thanks. It's unfortunate that we couldn't make a deal, but I'm pretty sure I'll find a good home for them anyway. Ah, I uh, dragged in another book for him. You're going to have to buy it then. Uh, what is it? Well, you've heard of uh, Geneva watches, right? Yeah. Well, this is the Geneva Bible. It's a Protestant Bible printed in the year 1583. You know, King Henry basically decided that he wanted a divorce and they wouldn't give it to him, so he basically ended Catholicism in England and started his own religion because he hated his wife that much. Men have been known to do a lot of things for women. Yeah, um, I can't imagine hating somebody that much. <laughs> My name is Adam. I'm coming back to the pawn shop today with a really interesting 16th century English Bible. It's known as the Geneva Bible. It's a really fascinating relic of history and an important book. So I'm asking $1,600. I mean, every copy is unique, and I think that's a reasonable and fair price for it. I don't think I've had one of these in here yet. Can I touch it or? Yeah, absolutely. Go these ahead. These things always scare me because they're fragile. Protestantism flourished in England, but then Mary came to the throne in 1553, and she wanted to revert England back to Catholicism. She banned these Bibles being printed. Yeah, that's exactly right. Didn't she burn out all the Protestants' eyes or something? Bloody Mary, that's it. You, you probably know the drink for sure. I mean, she definitely tortured and persecuted a lot of uh, Protestants. So the Protestants fled to Geneva, which was a refuge for them. And for the first time, really, they translated the entire Bible out of the original languages, Aramaic, Hebrew, and Greek, into an English Bible. And this was the first really accessible Bible that people could read in the English language. So for being that old, I mean, it's in pretty good shape, right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's got some condition flaws, for sure. OK. What are you looking to get out of it? I'm looking for a very modest price, I think. Like 1600 bucks for it. <sighs> They're still rare and desirable because it's an interesting Bible and it's so famous and it has such importance in history. I mean, if your dad was here, he would grab that in a second from me. Um, God, I wish I knew more about this stuff. But let me give Rebecca a call and have her come down and take a look at it. Cool, thanks a lot. That can only help me. She's extremely knowledgeable, and she's going to emphasize the importance and history of the Bible to him. I hope that's enough to sway him. All right, so what is it? I just don't know. I mean, I know it's a Geneva Bible. I know about Bloody Mary. I know about King Henry. But what a Bible's worth these days, I just don't know. I'm really glad Corey called me down. He seems so lost. One thing that we take for granted is that the Bible being translated into English was a revolutionary act for hundreds of years that would get you burnt at the stake. And this revolution affected our English language culture. I mean, this is the Bible that Shakespeare used. I mean, it is kind of funny that they printed it in English in a country where they don't speak English. They actually use smuggling networks to get it into England. So this was contraband. All yeah. for a book. That said, there's a lot of stuff going on here. Oh, yeah, it's, right? it's a complicated book. I know. <laughs> it's a very nice way to put it, Adam. First, the obvious thing is we've got the rebacking. So it's been repaired? Yeah, it's just a front joint repair, looks like. It's a little bit crude, I admit. I'm sorry, this repair job, it's so awful. Now let's concentrate on the importance of the Bible and the history. On the one hand, I like these little notes here. This was actually a, a study Bible, and they made little notations in the margins. Yeah, in some ways, those notes were what really upset other theologians, because there's a lot of, like, Protestant philosophy in there that people took issue with. I'm learning a lot today. <laughs> So, Adam, I know you know that this is somewhat common as far as rare books go. Oh, yeah, for sure. I was hoping it would be an impulse purchase. It would have to be in this condition. Sure. So what do you think it's worth? OK. I like the provenance. I like the history. But I think there's just so many other things that are a problem. I think, optimistically, you could try to ask 1500 for it. But let's try it this way. Should I buy it? No. No? Thank you. I appreciate it. <laughs> I'm going to pass. 
This is the first time you completely shot me down. I can't believe it. <laughs> Maybe she'll buy you lunch because I'm not buying your Bible. <laughs> yeah. Oh, poor, poor Bible. The Bible has some issues, but we all have issues.